Turn with me to Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. I want to read this again. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I want you to just take a few moments this morning and think about the imagery that we find when we hear the word rock in the word of God. There are many times in the Bible that we hear that word used in a way that always signifies something strong, something powerful, something great. In the Bible we find many times it is a rock which is a fortress. There's a, I think about Superstition Mountain out here. And I think about that, that it's really what the Bible calls a cleft. That narrow place, if you've ever taken the trail that takes you to the top of Flatiron, it is a place that you, as you go up that trail, the mountain is split and it gets steeper and steeper and then you come out onto that, that flat place on top, Flatiron. I can't think of a much better place if there were enemies coming and I wanted to escape than to escape up into those mountains. Once you get to Flatiron and you go further, you come to a place Back over in those mountains, I've never seen it. I've seen pictures of it. There's an old homestead up there in Superstition Wilderness and an apple orchard that is still there, apple trees that grow, and and an old building that was used as a homestead. And it's still there today. What a place to hide. In the Bible, the rock is a hiding place. The rock can often be a cave. David hid with his men that he was training for army, for war, he hid in the caves of Adullam, in the rock. He talks often in the Psalms about hiding in the rock. Here in the verse that we read, he talks about running to the rock that is higher than I. In other words, a place that is at a, at a rock and a situation that is much greater than I am, much more stable than I am. Sometimes I'm not too stable, amen, but God is always stable. Amen. This rock that he speaks of always brings stability. Amen. It is called a refuge, Amen. a place that you run to for safety, for yes. safekeeping. Yes. It is a place of hiding. It is a tower. Many times the rock was a tower in which you would hide in order to see the plans of the enemy as they were approaching. Sometimes it was a split in the rock. Sometimes it was just a high and hidden place. In the rock, if you remember, Moses was hidden in a cleft of the rock, a split place in the rock, as the glory of God passed by in that powerful passage of Scripture that we find in Exodus. Last week, we read where Peter had that great revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they had all kind of answers. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How many of you have come to that place in your life where you got that revelation to your heart? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. No more doubt about it. No more trying to figure things out. It comes a place that comes where you're you're willing and you're ready to yield to that truth. That he alone is the one who is higher than I, greater than I, the one who is a rock, a hidden place, a strong tower, a place where we are trained for war. He is the one who is able to protect us and keep us in the rock. I sometimes have heard in years past someone say that maybe their children or even themselves, you know, this, this is too hard for me to understand. Your message was too hard for me to understand. And I believe that if you're born again, the word is not difficult to understand. But I thought of that as I was preparing this message. If you love the Lord, if you're a believer, you can understand this word. There's nothing here today that you cannot understand and that will not bring truth and meaning to your life. The Bible says that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock of our salvation. I thought of as I was making my notes for this, I kept thinking of the old painting. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's an old painting, and it is a, 
It is a scene of a stormy waves in the ocean, just powerful stormy waves pounding upon this outcropping of rock that sticks up out of the water, and then the rock becomes a stone uh, image of the cross. And there's this woman who has apparently been tossed to and fro in the waves. She's drowning, but she has found the rock, and she's come up out of the water, and she's clinging to that rock clinging to that cross. It's a beautiful scene, this old painting. And it's a picture of every one of us, our salvation, as we cling. In the storms of this life, we cling to the rock that is higher than we are, the rock that is Christ Jesus and the truth of his cross. The rock. I was thinking of the rock of Gibraltar. How many of you learned about the rock of Gibraltar in school? One of the insurance companies today uses that image in their logo and in their advertisements, the Rock of Gibraltar. And the Rock of Gibraltar is this big anvil-shaped outcropping of rock that stands over the Straits of Gibraltar. The Straits of Gibraltar, Straits of Gibraltar is the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea, the southern tip of Asia, south of Spain, and the northern tip of Africa, the passageway of water that goes through there, and there's this huge uh, angled piece of rock, a mountainous piece of rock with a town at the base of it. It's called the Rock of Gibraltar. It's easily recognized from a distance. It confronts everyone who comes through that passageway into the Mediterranean Sea where there's a place of safety, a place of harbor, and I think about the Lord in that way, for every one of you and I, as we come through that passageway from death to life, as we came from our lostness to the place of salvation, we were confronted with the cross of Jesus Christ, weren't we? Confronted with the salvation, the salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. No other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to this place. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus, we find in the Word of God, is, or as we come to the Word of God, we find so many images of this where God is a rock, where we find the imagery of the rock, this glorious, immovable rock, the rock that cannot be moved, that confronts us as we come to the Lord. And I want to begin with this this morning to ask, why is this imagery so important? Why did God use this imagery and where does it take us if we follow it in the Word of God? If you go with me this morning, just follow this train of thought. Many people are skeptics and we know that there are many skeptics today that are always mocking the things of God. And how many of you have ever had someone tell you as you attempted to witness, have you ever had someone tell you, well, Jesus didn't claim to be the Son of God. You know, he was a good man, he was a prophet, but he didn't claim to be the Son of God. Well, they don't know the word, because Jesus did claim to be the Son of God. But then they'll also say, well, the Bible says he was the Son of God, but it does not say that he was God. And you understand, if you've come to Christ, that God took on human flesh, It came as a man, Jesus Christ, and gave himself for you and I. Amen? Amen. This is a truth of the gospel, a truth of the word of God. But they will say, well, he he doesn't say that he is God. And over and over in the Bible, you can find passages that show you and teach you about the deity of Christ, the Godhead or the Godhood of Christ. I want to walk you through this quickly this morning as the foundational truth in this passage of Scripture, the foundational truth before we look at where that takes us in the New Testament. I want us to go to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy. And one reason that I'm doing this, and I said there was some teaching in this this morning, not just preaching. One reason that I'm doing this this morning is that I want you to be well instructed in the Word of God. If someone makes that statement to you, you need to write these passages down. If someone makes that statement to you, you need to take them to these passages and show them. 
And we're not going to turn there, but most of you already know John chapter 1. Two verses of Scripture. Don't turn there. But John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. And we look at that and we don't entirely understand it when we first read it. But it says, In the beginning was the Word. But you can understand this statement. And the Word was God. The Word was with God, I'm sorry. And then the Word was God. So whatever that Word is, it was God. Amen? Amen. The Word is God. And then in that chapter, if you skip down to John 1, 14, it says, And the Word, which was God, remember, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth, the Son of God. So if God the Word became flesh, and that was Jesus, then Jesus is the Word, which was God, Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. Now I want you to show you, I want to show you how to do that following a different train of thought as we look at the rock. Deuteronomy 32, verses 1 through 4. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. The heart of what I want you to see in this passage is there at the end of verse 3 and the beginning of verse 4. Ascribe greatness to our God. So it's speaking of God. He. He who? God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Perfect. So we establish in this one verse, this one passage, that God is perfect and he is the rock. It doesn't say he's one rock, does it? It doesn't say he's a rock. It doesn't say he's one of many rocks. It says he is the rock. Amen. Now turn with me to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44 verse 8. I want to establish this with more than one verse. If you do a search in your concordance, you'll find dozens of verses in the Old Testament about God being the rock. Isaiah 44 verse 8. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? This is God speaking. You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, if God is God, he would know if there was another God, wouldn't he? Yes. He would know if there is another rock. He says, I am the rock. There is no other rock. There is no other God. This in, in, is a, a side train of thought here. Keep in mind if you're ever talking with Mormons, because they believe that God was once a man who became a God, and that we will once become, we will someday become gods uh, if we're good Mormons. And so... Those who believe that believe there, and they believe that there is a multitude of gods. Here is one verse, just one out of many, that declares that there is one God. God himself says, is there any other? I know not one, he says. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Second Samuel. You have to go backwards to Second Samuel, verse 32 and 33. <clears throat> verse 32, for, for who is God except the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. So once again, he's saying, who else is the rock besides our God? And the Bible is, of course, saying 
There is no other one. It is an exclusive title. Hear me this morning. The Rock is an exclusive title given to God. The Word of God is wonderful. Because you can take any single thought in the Bible and trace it through the entire Bible and find deep and marvelous things. The rock, just one of many Old Testament types and shadows that point to Christ in the future. So in the Old Testament, we find that Christ is revealed to us. And I've changed the train of thought here for just a moment. So follow me. You're well instructed in the Word of God, and we talk about types and shadows often. But in the Old Testament, there are symbolic things that God has done. It's like he wrote the gospel ahead of time and put images in the Old Testament by which we can look, and and they point to Christ. And then when Christ came, you could see that all these things were fulfilled in him. One of the most important being the Lamb of God. Over and over, the lamb in the Old Testament was slaughtered to take away sin. And then Jesus comes and John the Baptist says of Christ, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of the lamb sacrifices in the Old Testament were types or shadows pointing to Jesus, the lamb of God, on the cross of Calvary. So we have the lamb of sacrifice. As the Israelites came out of Egypt when Moses led them out, and they camped in the wilderness. They, they, their encampment was encircling the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. It was the, it was the place where God met with the priest and met with the entire nation, therefore, of Israel. And it was, it was called the tabernacle. It was the forerunner of the temple. And you've all seen the pictures, the il- illustrations of it with the pillar of cloud by day, the swirling cloud of column of cloud over the tabernacle and at night it became a pillar of fire that gave light to the entire encampment and the New Testament speaks of that as the presence of God there in the midst of that encampment. There's the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that was the lamb of sacrifice and we have established so far in this the another image that God is a rock. He is the rock. And if you remember when they came out of Israel, I mean, they came out of Egypt, and they were led out into the wilderness, and the, one of the first places they came to was a place where there was no water. And the people began to murmur and complain because they said, even though we were slaves in Egypt, we had water. And they cried out to Moses, and they blamed him for bringing them out of Egypt. And God spoke to Moses And the Lord told Moses, you see that big rock over there? And I'm paraphrasing. He said, take your staff and strike the rock. And water is going to come forth out of the rock. And it is a picture of the very life-giving presence, the water of the Holy Spirit coming from Christ, who was stricken on the cross of Calvary by those who crucified him. We find this kind of imagery, and I'm telling you all of that in order to paint a picture and lay a foundation for what we're about to see. And so as we look at that, those those elements, the cloud, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, the rock, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 over in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 1 through 15. And from here on, we're going to be seeing what God says about the rock as Jesus comes as the fulfillment of all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. As I said when I began, this seems more like a study. It's more like a Bible study this morning than a sermon. And you may be thinking, where's the practical? I'm going to tell you, we began with the scripture that says, when I am overwhelmed, I go to the rock that is higher than I. Mm -hmm. This is so relevant to us. The time that we're living in right now, the circumstances in which we find ourselves, You need to know him as the rock. Not only the rock of your salvation, but the rock in which you hide yourself. 
the rock in which, which you find protection, the rock where you climb up onto that rock that is higher than I in order to get the right view of things all around you and to see what the enemy has planned as he comes against you, the rock where you find yourself established in the Lord, the rock where you find what you need for your family, the rock where you find what you need in order to overcome temptation and to walk with the Lord, the rock of your salvation, the rock that is higher than I. In verse 1 it says, Moreover, brethren, now Paul is talking about those types and shadows. And I want you to see how he draws it all together. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you, I, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. What cloud? The cloud that was over the tabernacle by day and fire by night. All of our fathers were under the cloud. You see, that cloud, it is believed, according to Jewish understanding of the Word of God, it is believed that that column of cloud went up, uh, up and then spread out and became a covering of cloud over the entire encampment during the heat of the day. Because many times in the Old Testament, it says that that cloud kept them from the burning sun. And gave them shade and coolness during the day. The sun, we understand that living here in the desert. It would have been a death sentence to them. But they had the cloud that kept them cool and protected them. Shaded them from that harm. He says again, all of our fathers were under the cloud. That speaks of all of the tribes of Israel in their beginning as they were, as they came out of Egypt. All were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. What sea? It is when the Israelites came out and they, they came to the place at the sea where God told Moses to lift up, lift up his staff and the waters would part. And the Red Sea parted in, on each side and the wind blew and dried a path for them to pass through. But what does he say about that? They passed through the sea. He's going to explain it. All were baptized. See, he's going to talk about baptism in the New Testament. But first, he tells them all were baptized into Moses in the cloud. He is revealing that Moses is a picture of Christ delivering people. Delivering the people of God out of the bondage of Egypt. It's a picture of us being delivered by our Moses, Jesus Christ, out of the bondage of sin into the freedom that he gives as we come out of our past and we come out of sin, we come out of that death sentence that was upon us. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses. We're baptized, what? Into Christ. They were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, as they came through that sea, as it parted, and they were under that cloud as they came through, it was a foreshadowing of baptism for us. And it was their initiation. It was their baptism into the freedom that God was bringing them out into as they left Egypt. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. What spiritual food did they eat? Angels' food, manna that fell from heaven when they complained because they did not have food to eat in the wilderness. God sent them fresh manna every morning. They had a supply of food that came straight from the hand of God. And it was a foreshadowing of every truth in the Word of God, every promise in the Word of God, everything that we feed upon in the Word of God that satisfies our soul. The things that come from Christ. The spiritual food. How many of you know? You may not even know. How many of you know you have to have spiritual food to live a spiritual life? You have to have spiritual food to walk with Christ. You can't walk in this wilderness very long and not fall down and faint and eventually die without food. You can't walk with the Lord. You can't be the believer. You can't walk in power and might in a desert place spiritually. You can't live in the trials and troubles and the overwhelming times 
that we find ourselves in in this world without food, spiritual food, spiritual food that nourishes our soul, that strengthens us, that builds us up and helps us to grow from being a baby Christian to being a mature son or daughter of God. We have to have spiritual food. And he's saying here that that spiritual food that they had sustained them and kept them. And they all drank, and we'll see what that is in a moment, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank the water that came out of the rock. We drink of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that we might be satisfied and filled with Christ. Himself, it all comes from Christ. He's the one who feeds us. He's the one who gives this to us. So I'm going to read part of that again. They all drank, they all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock. What rock? The Israelites, they were partaking of water that literally came forth out of a rock. Now listen closely for a moment because it happened on two occasions. It happened at the beginning when they came out of Israel, I mean out of Egypt. Years later it happened again. But but Paul is implying something further than that here. Listen to this wording. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock that followed them. Paul is saying here that everywhere that they went where they needed water, there was water that would come from the rock to satisfy them. Everywhere that they went, 40 years in the wilderness, no matter where they were, if they were thirsty and dry and desperate, there was water that came from the rock. And then the next line says, and that rock was Christ. We find this amazing truth in the word of God that Christ was with them before he was ever born of a babe in Bethlehem. He's called the pre-incarnate Christ before he ever was incarnate, before he ever took on human flesh and came in Bethlehem as part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was present with them in the wilderness. He was present with the prophets. He was present with different ones in different ways that we find. When when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, if we study that passage and we study what Jesus said about it in the New Testament, Jesus was in that burning bush saying, I am that I am. He was God. And here it says they all drank of that same spiritual rock that followed them And that rock, okay, in the Old Testament, who said, I am the rock and there is no other? God. And now in the New Testament, it says they all drank of that rock and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock of God. He is God in human flesh who came and offered himself out of love for you and I on the cross of Calvary. There's no greater thing in all of all of time and space and history and all the universe. No greater truth than that God loved us so much that he took on human flesh and came and suffered and bled and died for you and I. And in the Old Testament, he's called the rock. In the New Testament, he's Christ, the rock. In the Old Testament, he's God, the rock. In the New Testament, he's Christ, the rock. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You remember, the whole generation had to die, and a new generation would go into the promised land because of their un belief. And so the central truth before we finish this morning, the last two things that I want to show you, the central truth is that Christ, who is God, is your rock, is your rock. And beside him, there is no other, no other God, no other protection, 
no other one who satisfies, no other spiritual drink, no other food, nothing that can meet your needs, no other salvation but Jesus Christ, nothing else but him. So the Bible says in the Old Testament, God is my rock. The New Testament says Christ is my rock. The Old Testament says God is our salvation. The New Testament says that only in Christ is our salvation. The Old Testament says God is a rock of refuge. The New Testament says Christ is our refuge. The Old Testament says everything we need from God comes from above. The New Testament says it comes from Christ. That rock was Christ. He satisfied their hunger with manna. Christ satisfies our hunger with himself. He satisfied their thirst with water from the rock. Christ satisfies our thirst with the living water that comes from him, the rock of God. Once we understand that Jesus is the rock of God, then it gives a little bit of a new and fresh truth and understanding to these two things in the Word of God. Matthew chapter 7 is a parable that Jesus told, and then First Peter chapter 2 we'll go to lastly. Matthew chapter 7, we're going there, <laughs> beginning with verse 24. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus tells a story about the man who built his house on the sand. This parable is about our foundation in the Lord. And the last thing that we're going to read in 1 Peter is about the incredible importance of it and what it means. Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So how could I rephrase that? I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on God, who built his house upon Christ, who is the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Its foundation was upon the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and great was its fall. I could stand here this morning and I could tell you story after story of individuals I've known and of families that I have known. Some families, their house, their life is built upon the rock. And I have seen the individuals in those households and I have seen those families endure things that most people just would never think they could ever endure. I have seen families and I have seen individuals whose life is truly built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ that have had incredible circumstances come against their life and against their families where it seems like all hell has been released against them. And no sooner have they gotten through one horrible crisis than something else happens. People who have endured the loss of children or the loss of loved ones and then on top of that some horrible sickness and then on top of that some calamity, some loss of property or some loss of job and income and just one blow after another just seemingly relentless like that painting that I talked about in the beginning with the storm waves just pounding on them from every side. But their life is built. And sometimes it seems like all you can do is cling. Yes. But your foundation is built on that rock. But yes. sometimes it seems like all you're able to do is cling. But Amen. you're clinging to the rock 
And the rock is immovable. And as long as you'll cling to that rock, you cannot be beaten. You cannot be shaken. You cannot be carried away by the storm. And your foundation will not be broken down. And your house will stand. It's a miraculous thing. It's a miraculous thing. I've seen families that people just shake their heads because they have smiles on their faces as they lift their hands and they worship God. And people behind them in the church are looking at them saying, how can they be at peace? How can they have peace in a time like this? How can they be at peace when there's calamity falling upon them from every side? And then I've seen other people in the church. I've seen other people and there is no evidence of any foundation at all. They run with whatever thing is motivating them emotionally at the time. A wind of, of testing or trial comes and they, they don't hide in Christ their rock. They, they hide in some thing that the world gives them that they think gives them comfort. It may be a destructive thing like alcohol, or it may be something that's not wrong in itself. They may lose themselves in some passion, some sport, some hobby, hiding themselves from these things that come. But all the while, they're not whole. They're broken down on the inside. I've seen people like this. I've seen families fall, literally fall to the enemy of their soul. Because their foundation was not the rock of God, the rock which is Christ Jesus. But their foundation has been built upon their own opinions, their own ideas, their own thoughts, and their own desires. And when those storm waves come, they try to grasp for something that there's nothing substantial to grasp. Because they've not established the foundation in their life. And beloved, I'm here to tell you this morning, there is nothing more important than getting your foundation right. When you build a house, if you don't get the foundation right, it may seem really beautiful for a while. But over time, as that the rains fall and the muddy ground begins to sink and things begin to shift and begin to change. If there's no foundation built upon something solid and something like rock, that house will begin to shift and it will begin to give way in places and sooner or later it will cave in. There will be places where destruction takes its toll upon that house. The house has to be built upon a foundation. And if you want a wonderful, beautiful house, You may rush and in a hurry, you may build one the wrong way, but you'll be sorry in the long run that you ever built it that way. And a lot of Christians are like that. They think that if they run in on Sunday morning, they raise their hands. Or they have an emotional experience with the God. Oh God, I felt God today. Oh, I had goosebumps. (laughs) Then during the week when the hard times begin to slap them in the face, they have no strength. They have no power. They have no overcoming strength within them. Because their foundation has been built upon their own thoughts, their own emotions, their own desires. What they choose is right. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it is death. It's destruction. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Those who build their house upon the strong foundation, which is Christ, build it upon the rock. No storm can shatter it. And if that's what you want, you build your house upon this word. This word. This is where Christ speaks to you his word to give you the foundation that you build your life upon. And it will stand test. Time. Then, as you look at First Peter chapter two, this is where we talk about those who are believers as opposed to those out in the world. First Peter two verses four through ten. 
verse 4, coming to him, that's Christ, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men. The Bible says he was rejected, a man of sorrows, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Christ is a rock, he's a stone, he's the stone, and we'll see in a moment he's the cornerstone of the temple of God. Spiritual temple, a living temple. And you are living stones in that temple that he's building, his church. Therefore it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. You may not say it in these words, but one of the greatest fears that people have, you may word it a different way, but it's of being put to shame. Of being put to shame that everything you did amounted to nothing. And every choice you made only led to calamity. Every decision that you made only led to your family falling apart. All of that is humiliating and hard to bear. But he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, I've got to pause here. I want you to see how that's written in your Bible. It's a quote. It's a quote. It's, it's found. We're not going to turn there, but it's in Psalm 118, 22. Jesus also quotes it in, in the Gospels. But it, it begins in Psalm 118, 22. In Psalm 118.22, it says the stone that the builders rejected, it's talking about the temple, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Who on earth, what was he talking about? What would anybody in David's day, when he wrote the psalm, what would they have thought he meant? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And it goes on and says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation. So we're going to stop right there. I want to just tell you something from history and we're almost done. In the time when Jesus came, in the time when Peter wrote this, when Jesus made that same statement, when he said the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, every Jew suddenly remembered part of their history. It's not in the Bible. I'm not saying that it is an eternal truth. I'm saying that it sheds light on this because it was a story that the Jews grew up being told it was something that they knew from their history. And it was this, that when Solomon, Solomon was building the temple, the original temple, when Solomon was building the temple and he had the blueprints, they had the blueprints God had given through David, had the blueprints for the temple, and they were mining the stones, they were quarrying down, it's called Solomon's Quarry. They were mining these rocks, and they were cutting them at the quarry according to the size they needed to be perfectly to fit because God said that no sound of a tool could be made on the site of the building of the temple. It was all to be done quietly. Reverence for the holiness of God. So down in the quarry they're taking the blueprints and they're cutting accurately all of these stones. And they all are going into place up on the Temple Mount where they're building the temple. And then this one stone, 
You can see this stone today. If you go to Jerusalem, you can go to the uh, underground part where you see the foundation of the original wall that's still there, the wall of the temple, and you will find that there it's marked for you is a 500 ton stone that is the cornerstone of all the temple. But when it was being built many years before on Solomon's at Solomon's temple, when the temple was being built, that stone was brought up from the quarry to the temple site, and they tried to find where it went. They looked at the blueprints, and something didn't make sense. And they tried to put it in place, and it it didn't seem right. Nothing seemed right with it. Just like in your life, how many years did you live and Christ did not seem to fit into your life at all? He wasn't the cornerstone. And that stone didn't seem to be right. And they took that stone and they rejected it and they cast it all the way back down the mountain into Kidron Valley that you hear mentioned in the Word of God. And they tried to build the temple of God and they could not build it. Until someone said, you know what, you remember that that cornerstone that we rejected? Let's try it again. And now with a new frame of mind, they had the cornerstone brought from down in the valley. And with everything else going into place, it fit perfectly. It became the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of the temple of God. Jesus speaking of himself. Because he would be rejected by man. Rejected by the religious leaders. But he would become the cornerstone of the temple of God. His church. The living temple of God. Jesus said, have you not read? Have you not read that the stone that the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone? Quoting from Psalm 118. Peter says here in this passage of scripture. Stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The one that you rejected for much of your life, some of you. The one that the world rejects. And he goes on and he says in the rest of this passage, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. A stone of stumbling. How many people have stumbled over that rock their whole life? They hear about Jesus, but it doesn't fit with their foundation that they're building. It doesn't fit into the pattern for their life. And so they don't accept it. And it's rejected and cast away. And it is a stone of stumbling because they don't understand it. So many people have stumbled over Christ. And it's offensive to them. The message of the cross of a man being slaughtered on a cross for their sins. The very fact that they're being called a sinner is offensive to many people. Especially today. Because today in our world, there's no such thing as sin. Except maybe racism and intolerance. But they don't want to hear the message of the cross. And so... They stumble over it. In another place, Jesus said, he said if they, if one falls upon it, and what he meant was in humility and surrender, if someone falls upon this stone, they'll be broken. He meant in a good way. When we're broken and we're able to come to Christ, we're broken of self. He said, but if it falls on them, they will be crushed. One day we'll all stand before the stone, the cornerstone, the rock, Christ. On that day of judgment, we either fall upon him now and allow ourselves to be broken of self. Or we are crushed by that same rock when he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Today, it's a glorious thing. This rock. This rock, it means that for you, he is immovable. You may, you may want him to do things that he won't do. 
You may pray and beg him and say, oh God, please, please, please let me win that lottery. And you don't understand why you can't win that lottery. But he is immovable, but it's a good thing. Because if he could be moved by you or I, he would not be God. And he would be moved by things that are our ways and our thoughts are imperfect. We don't know what's best. But he's a good father as well as a rock. Yes, he is. And he is able to give us what we need. And he does answer prayer. But he answers the prayers that line up with his will for our life. And that will help catapult us into the fullness of what he wants for us. He's got promise after promise for us. That he will fulfill in our lives. If we'll fall upon that rock and be broken. And say, I yield. I yield. I know that I'm preaching to the choir. You were lovers of Christ. I'm just saying this morning, see him as beautiful as he is as our rock. And build very consciously and deliberately build your foundation. Some of you may follow him and love him, and but there's no, no deep thought for this. Is my life built right? Is it built right on this foundation? Have I got the basics in first? And am I seeking to be obedient to what he wants for my life? Because anything else leads to being crushed. Anything else leads to calamity. Anything else leads to destruction. It's the winds come and they blow against the house. Some of you have families. It's critical that you build your family life and What you teach your children that everything be built upon this rock foundation because you want your family to be able to stand. Some of you look at what's coming down the road and what the Bible says about the hard times before Jesus comes again and you're like, oh, that's fearful and I don't want my family to go through that. What you need to be thinking is how do I build their foundation right? So that they stand. They stand and they are a testimony to Christ in that time. Surrender this morning. Everything within your life to the rock. He becomes a fortress so strong that you can't be destroyed by the enemy. You can't be defeated. And all those things that you think are tearing your life apart right now. Sometimes it's all in here and nobody else knows what's going on, but it's inward turmoil. He is stable. He's a rock. Yes. And if we're anchored in him and our thoughts are in him, we're going to fly. Amen. We're going to succeed. We're going to be able to stand strong and we'll have the peace of God knowing that he is the one who's keeping us. Amen. 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 Let's pray.